I'll tell you when it's live. Okay, we should be live. Uh, so if you refresh that, it might take a, a minute or so. Okay, keep checking. Yeah, it's gone. Now, there you go. Right, perfect. Okay. So bear with me, folks, if you're just joining us now, because I'm going to get this out to social media. It takes a bit of a, a couple of minutes, but... Uh, while we get your uh, the viewers in, uh, yeah, what have you been up to since last time we spoke at the interview, Chris? Uh, yeah, interestingly, I, um, I've been doing my PPL, which seems a bit uh, sort of back to front. But, uh, <laughs> I, I never actually got my PPL before I uh, joined the Air Force. I sort of did, um, you know, 99% of it. I had a couple of scholarships. I had a RAF scholarship and a Air League scholarship, and uh, I think that totaled about 35 hours of the 40 or so that was required at the time. I think it also included the exams. But uh, I, I found out I was joining up, and I, uh, you know, I, 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 just, I suppose I was just a bit, uh, bit young and keen, and didn't think about the, um, you know, sort of the good practice of finishing the, uh, the PPL off. So yeah, so I didn't finish it, and then uh, now that I'm in a desk job and frustrated by not flying, I decided to go and uh, do my PPL finally. So I had to do the exams again, and then a quick skills test, and sort of send some paperwork off to the CAA. But I'm sort of just waiting for that to come back, and then I can start actually flying paying for it myself, which will be very uh, unusual. <laughs> yeah, but you told me uh, recently, uh, um, for others, uh, the people who are joining us at the moment, get your questions in, because me and Chris are going to have a, a bit of a natter while the questions come in for Chris. But uh, you went on holiday recently, didn't you? That's right, yeah. So uh, just a How was break. that? Uh, yeah, it was good. Uh, I took the, uh, took the pace right out of life, to be fair. Went and uh, did a narrow boating holiday. So. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> We left a little one with uh, the grandparents for a week, so uh, yeah, just uh, that was quite nice. Uh, we actually went to the Brecon Beacons, which is not where you first think of when you think about narrow boating, but there's a canal about halfway up one of the uh, valley sides, so it's quite unusual anyway. So uh, yeah, did that, and then we had a second week where we went up to um, North Yorkshire and took took our little girl as well, and uh, we visited some friends up there because obviously we were based up there at Linton for um, four years or so. So just visited some friends and uh, reminisced a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, a bit slower pace for you and your wife, what you flew, so... <laughs> yeah, so still quite challenging to steer around, though. The canal there is pretty narrow. I have to concentrate a bit, to be perfectly honest. And everything happens in slow motion, which includes crashes, so, you know... <laughs> oh, right, really? Yeah. yeah Do you have to, be trained? Do you have to actually be trained on that, or is it just get in the boat and then off you go? No, I think it's so. I think the the you're, you're going so slowly that even if you crash it, it doesn't really cause much damage. So, uh, yeah, they just let you... Uh, they did do a little quick... 20 minutes sort of poodle up poodle down just to make sure that you uh, sort of had the rough idea and then yeah off they off they released you in their their pride and joy <laughs> brilliant so uh thanks for joining us if you're just uh, getting in there uh, the comments there now but uh chris yeah because obviously if people haven't seen your initial interview uh, there was a two-parter on the vc10 and obviously the Takano. yeah if you can give us a couple of minutes just so people can get a gist of your career that would be great uh, yeah, so I uh, joined the Air Force at um, 18, straight from school after my A-levels. I'd always wanted to be uh, a pilot in the Air Force, and um, so set about uh, doing officer training and then flying training. Um, I ended up going up to Linton as a basic fast jet student, but uh, found that quite challenging, and at the end of Linton was restreamed to uh, multi-engine. So I did a quick conversion on the King Air that had just come in at the time. Um, and then went on to the VC-10. So I was on the VC-10 as a co-pilot for uh, just over three and a half years, um, doing air to air refueling and air transport. And then after that, uh, didn't stay on as a captain. The sort of options were stay as a captain or leave and become an instructor. So I left and uh, started my instructor training. And then I was an instructor on the tutor to start with, so doing elementary flying training. And then a uh, on the Takano as uh, basic fast jet, uh, and I did that for about four years. So uh, and then briefly on the A400 uh, before I got promoted. And uh, since then, unfortunately, I've been on a desk job. So occasionally flying with the air cadets on the tutor, um, and as I just said uh, in the intro, uh, and now uh, hoping to do some PPL flying as well. So to keep my keep my fix because I do like to get airborne as much as possible. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah, guys, get your questions coming in, but I'm going to sneak one in here, and it's a bit of a nerdy one here, Chris. Um, how did you find, yeah, you know, like flying with the uh, on the Takano with the helmets? Did you find it, like, uh, a bit of a pain with the masks and the going back to the helmets, or did you like it? 
No, when I uh, when I went up there as a student, so obviously for the first time, I um, I really liked it because it felt different. I'd done quite a lot of uh, light aircraft flying um, previously, you know, prior to joining the Air Force as an air cadet and just on my own time. Um, so I was used to wearing a headset and having a, a mic. And then in the tutor, you flew with a helmet, but again with a mic. So I think moving on to the car, I remember just thinking that I'd moved past what you could do as a, a civilian. So, you know, I had a, a helmet with an oxygen mask. I was sitting on an ejection seat and my instructor was sat behind me and was obviously just a voice in my head. So <laughs> it just felt it just felt a bit more military um, than what I had previously been doing on the tutor, which was effectively just light aircraft flying, but with a military uh, taste to it. Absolutely. So, Chris, you can see there's a, a couple of questions coming in there, so I'm going to let you loose. But, uh, guys, get your questions coming in for Chris because it's going to be a great Q&A. Uh, so, yeah, enjoy. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, starting at the top, we've got um, MGM, so a bit of background, why the VC-10 is carnate. So I sort of just covered that anyway, but I will just, just in case you missed it. So um, VC-10 was my first tour as a co-pilot after I'd been uh, streamed to multi-engine. So I did... Um, three and a half years on that and then at the end of uh, my time on the vc10 effectively you can stay as a captain or you can um leave and go and become an instructor which i chose to do i then um became a instructor on the tutor and uh, did that for about a year and a half and then was sent to afghanistan for about six months and then when i came back i asked if i could go up to takane which i had learned to fly as a student i just hadn't carried on down the fast jet route um, and because i was already an instructor then um the uh, you know, sort of personnel uh, and the people that decide where we go for our jobs were happy for me to do that. So I was posted up to Linton on Tucano uh, with my uh, my wife. So a bit of co-location there. So that was why I ended up flying VC-10 to Tucano. But you're right, very different aircraft. Uh, yeah, okay. So everyone's uh, far is that I've the set of VC-10. Me too. Absolutely. It's a beautiful aircraft. Um, and um, what did you think were the, uh, the more practical highlights of the airplane service? Yeah, so the VC-10 I thought was uh, really well uh, designed and engineered. You know, it's a sort of 1950s design, 1960s build um, back in the day when everything was sort of uh, sort of built with a lot of redundancy in it. And because of that, the Air Force was then able to use it um, and sort of had a very versatile approach, uh, particularly after it. It had been in service for quite a while. So I came to the VC-10 quite late, you know, 2010, uh, sorry, 2007 to 2010. So, um, yeah, we'd been using it a long time. It was now being used as an air transport and a tanker aircraft. So it, you know, the, the way they uh, used it was uh, really good and gave a great variety for the type of flying you would do. And um, we did aeromeds as well. And uh, we did QRA, so quick reaction um, to sort of, support the uh, fast jets that were on QRA. So lots of different flying uh, and it seemed to do it all pretty well. So I think the only downside for the VC-10 was it was very noisy and uh, it burnt an awful lot of fuel, which was probably you know, what put pay to it being a commercial airliner in the end. Uh, VC-10, yeah, so uh, <laughs> VC-10 or KC-135, apart from the boom, are they two different make a valid comparison? Um, so I, I don't know that much about the KC-135, although we did have um, an American exchange officer on the squadron uh, who would serve with the squadron for two to three years and effectively was, for all intents and purposes, a, a, a pilot on the squadron. And uh, that guy had come from the 135 and he was able to convert across onto the VC-10 and tank in the way that the Royal Air Force uh, went about his business. So obviously not too different um, from speaking to people uh, that are the receivers so fast jet pilots and people like that then uh, obviously tanking off a hose and drogue or a um, boom is very different obviously a boom you just arrive behind the aircraft and then the boom operator at the back does the does the sort of final part of the maneuvering to get the uh, hose to connect um, whereas the hose and drogue we just trail the hoses behind the aircraft and then the pilot who's doing the receiving of the fuel has to do all the uh, has to do all the uh, hard work uh, and then the other option is that some of the KC-135s would have a boom with a hose attached which I, I won't use the name that it had but it had quite a rude name um, and I know that most pilots didn't enjoy tanking off that because it was quite problematic because it was only a very short hose and it used to whip around quite a lot. Uh, Fabian we got top three book recommendations about flying. Oh. It's funny actually I, I do enjoy reading but I'm not a, 
massive fan of reading um reading books about aviation although there's obviously a few behind on the and, and the uh, but they're mainly for show um so if i do if i have read any i've read um i was on 72 squadron which was the squadron that flew the Takano, and there's some books called um swift um to battle there which goes on about the history of uh 72 up to um it being a, a jet squadron in sort of the 50s and 60s so that was quite interesting i felt that was important to read just purely because i was on that squadron and sort of was a custodian of the the history and sort of making new history going forward and i oversaw the centenary for that squadron so i thought that was quite important um I do remember reading some when I was younger before I joined, but uh, I think that was mainly because uh, I was, uh, you know, told told to and keen to make sure that my knowledge didn't have any gaps in it for when I was interviewed for selection and things like that. Okay, so Ian Davies, uh, what's your opinion on the C-17? Have you heard what it's like to fly? Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a busy time. Yeah, so the C-17 uh, is a, it was a great aircraft. Uh, we obviously had the four that we leased uh, around the same time that I was on the VC-10 and it came in really quickly and uh, did a fantastic job and its serviceability was uh, immense as well compared with the TriStar and the VC-10 which were both aging aircraft. Um, it was really reliable. Um, we used it as a strategic transport um, whereas the Americans sort of use it somewhere in between that and tactical because obviously it can do rapid descents, it can do uh, rough landings, it can do short field so it's probably more capable than we choose to use it but obviously we have the Herc and now the A400 for that sort of flying. Um, but yeah and then obviously it was so so good that we bought the four that we'd um, leased from the Americans and we bought another four as well so um, and to indicate how much we use them and their, their serviceability with the, the entire fleet of C-17s that Boeing have, the Air Force C-17s became the fleet leaders in terms of hours. So Boeing were then looking to the Air Force to see what problems might arise uh, as the fleet went forward because we were flying them more than the Americans were. Um, so, yeah, and the, the serviceability did drop off a little bit, but um, they still remain very reliable and a very capable aircraft. Yeah, so uh, Byron said... So, uh, and said uh, when flying uh, transport in the VC-10 any interesting destinations there are people stories yeah um, I mean the good thing about the VC-10 was it didn't have um, um, a defensive aids or no defensive aids that we fitted so it didn't do much uh, air transport into the um, into the Middle East so sort of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan so that meant that we were left when we did do air transport to do the rest of the world so we we're mainly doing um, exercises and um, uh, so the states um, uh, Central America, like Belize or Canada, um, and occasionally Africa as well. So, but I, I mean, I didn't myself, but there were also trips to the Far East. Um, uh, there was a thing called Trails, which effectively was the uh, mix of air transport and refueling. So, if you imagine that when you want to take smaller jets to uh, far flung reaches of the globe, then they can't get there on their own. They haven't got the fuel for it, or if they did, they would have to stop very regularly. So, what you do is you put them with a tanker and you fly as a formation, uh, which extends the range. Um, and you can um, you know, obviously go to places like America and things like that. So um, trails were a good good balance of both because you got to uh, see different parts of the world, but also you were doing refueling as well. Um, so yeah, good good stories. Uh, I have a think and come back to that one. I think. Um, so Anthony, it's got my uh, kind of uh, so skip down. My question, some said with the Takano as they were hand built, each was unique. Yeah, so that's something I've, uh, I put a proper cat amongst the pigeons there. So yeah, the Takanos were built in uh, Belfast by Schwartz uh, and they're a Brazilian design there, and, um, but Schwartz built them. They are, yeah, they are hand built. And because of that, then they're not, you know, they're not on a factory production line like we would imagine these days. So there are differences. Uh, they are all metal panels. Um, they're riveted together. You So, yeah, they are slightly different, but of course those slight differences can make, uh, have quite a big impact in terms of the handling and the characteristics. But yeah, absolutely, there was a student pilot who um, would, could not fit in 10 of the aircraft um, because uh, he was too tall. So there, you know, it wasn't just that the length was different, there were also um, differences in sort of cockpit and things like that. So um, yeah, it's just, just the nature of the way they were built. Um, but they were still a great aircraft, and uh, you know, and 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 the build quality, it's not like the build quality was terrible, it's just the way that they were built. Um, and yeah, sorry, they did handle it a little bit differently, so um, but not not anything that you would really really notice. Maybe some had slightly lower or slower roll rates than others, for example. 
Uh, Ian Davies, uh, yeah, would you like to fly on a BBMF? Absolutely. BBMF is always something that I wanted to do uh, and want to do. Um, there are criteria for joining it. So you have to be in a flying job. So unfortunately, at the moment, I'm in a desk job, so I can't go to it yet. Um, you need to have, I think, 3,000 hours uh, and you do need to have interviews and things like that. It's also not a permanent job in the Air Force. It is a secondary duty, if, if you like. So um, you, you do it. In, you, know, you need to have a flying job full time and then you and then you do it on the side as well. So uh, for me, as a multi-engine pilot, then I would uh, be uh, applicable to fly the Dakota and then the Lancaster, which uh, would be fantastic. I mean, obviously, I'd love to fly the Spitfire, but that's sort of reserved for the fast jet guys. So, um, but flying, you know, one of only two fly, uh, remaining Lancasters would be absolutely amazing. So, it is something that I plan to um, apply to as soon as I can, um, which will probably be August next year when I start on 45 Squadron instructing there. But yeah, good question. It's something I've always wanted to do. They're fantastic. Uh, MGM, uh, what are your thoughts on the Takano as a ground support platform? Yeah, it's obviously not an A-10 or an A-16. Yeah, so there's some going going around at the moment in Afghanistan, to be fair, because, of course, the Americans bought some for the Afghan Air Force. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're quite good. I mean, the Americans did a, uh, you know, went for a process to decide which aircraft they were going to buy for the Afghans in a, in a sort of ground support, ground attack role, and it was the Super Takano that they went for. I mean, the good thing about a turboprop is it's efficient, it's relatively slow speed, and it's manoeuvrable, um, but you can, you know, put a decent amount on the wings. So if you're not looking for anything too advanced, then they're, they're a good aircraft. You know, the A-10 and the F-16 are obviously a, a league above. The A-10 is a standout you know, ground, uh, you know, ground attack aircraft, close air support aircraft, uh, hence why it's still around. Um, and I don't think we'll really any, see anything that ever replaces it as uh, you know, as well as it was designed. And the F-16, um, obviously being such a versatile aircraft, um, means that it can it can do CAS and, and, and close air support and uh, ground attack very, very well as well. So, yeah, I um, Takano is a nice, simple solution, and sometimes that's all you need. Um, I think the Brazilians use it in that role as well. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's not a bad aircraft. It's definitely maneuverable enough and it's cheap to run. So, uh, Okay, so how many different types of is there? Yeah, Indian, et cetera, pro -prip. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's not something I actually kept track of in my um, uh, in my logbook, uh, who I was tanking, um, but you do get a good mix. Mainly where I tanked was um, Afghanistan so and Iraq, so that would have been American um, Navy because they use um, hose and drogue, not the Air Force because they use boom. So American Navy, American Marines, so a lot of F-18s, um, and then uh, and their uh, Prowler aircraft as well. Um, back in Europe, when you're doing exercises, then you might do... Um, you might refuel Euro fighters of the various nations uh, when they were around the German uh, the German tornadoes still. Um, but of course, there are not as many different types of fast jet out there as there once was. So the variety has dropped off somewhat. Um, but yeah, Italians, definitely Germans, yes. Um, I don't think I ever refueled any French, but I'm sure some of my colleagues would have. Um, and lots of American, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Anthony said there, you mentioned that you feel the tutor. Do you think it was an easy plane for students to train on? <laughs> and the prefect, a good replacement. Oh, we could go down a proper rabbit hole on the prefect, so I have to make sure I uh, behave myself. But yeah, the tutor is fine. It's uh, you know it's a simple uh, you know, piston light aircraft. It's it's exactly what you want for an elementary trainer. You know, fixed gear, not too much power. It's a nice way of introducing someone into flying. And the assumption in um, in the air force was that elementary flying training you started from no prior flying experience. Now, in most cases, people did have prior flying experience because yeah, most people had decided quite young that they wanted to be pilots and therefore they would have you know, tried to uh, whatever they could do to prepare themselves for joining the air force but the course was set that you had no prior flying experience and for that reason the tutor was was great at that uh, and yeah it's a nice aircraft to fly the only problem with the tutor was a little bit underpowered as most light aircraft are and uh, it had a terrible roll rate but it's it's not an aerobatic aircraft so you know why would it have a particularly fast roll rate the um prefect is unusual in my my opinion for a elementary flying trainer it's a turboprop so we now have the situation where we have two turboprops we have a prefect and we have a texan um i wasn't involved in decision making that and uh, so i don't know what the mindset was but um it's a great aircraft and i do know some people that have flown it and have, uh, one of my friends has recently graduated as a student on it and he loved it it's got great software it's very much in keeping with the modern aircraft that the air force now finds itself <coughs> excuse me using but um Potentially, it's, I think it's maybe a little bit advanced for an elementary flying trainer. That being said, 
if you look at most modern air forces around the world that have sort of generated a more modern training system most go for a two-tier system so they go for a system where you have a turboprop perhaps the the pc21 is a good one where you can sort of almost have a, a mode where the power is lessened it's almost like having stabilizers on a bike and that's for your element training and then if the uh, candidate is selected for fast jet and that's what you want to do then you can um upgrade the uh you know, switch a, a you know a, a mode and uh, have the full power of the engine which then prepares you nicely for going on to jet so yeah so um it's an interesting choice i'm not quite sure the reasoning behind it Yeah, how do you keep yourself occupied in longer sectors? Was it useful to have catering facilities available? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, anyone that's done their transport flying will know that it's pretty tedious um, in between the bits of taking off and landing. Um, there was a few good points on the VC-10. Firstly, four-man flight deck, so or four-person flight deck, I should say. So, um, yeah, there was lots of people to chat to, whereas, of course, most modern airlines, it's just two of you, so um, you need to get on with the person that you're, um, you're with. Um, and... Uh, you also when we were flying a transport we had a full crew down the back of um cabin supervisors and uh, they were always good fun as well so and then of course yes as you pointed out full galley um so yeah i must admit eating was um one of the ways to pass the time so you sort of planned around um when you were going to have your meals and uh you know and how that was going to fit in and the selection was usually pretty good as well so yeah it was it was a way of passing the time particularly for things like going across the atlantic and stuff yeah um is, is pretty is pretty quiet and pretty uh, pretty boring at times so you do have to find ways to entertain yourselves um probably even more boring than um, the air transport was the tanking missions in between having receivers come up to get fuel and sometimes that could be an hour if not an hour and a half waiting for a receiver to come and get fuel um so that's when um you you haven't got a crew down the back uh, and you're just flying around in circles so actually um that's when you really find it hard to keep uh, keep yourself entertained so that's again the good reason for having a full man flight deck and we used to play a uh, trivial pursuit and games like that to uh, to keep ourselves entertained. So MGM, um, how was your experience teaching the Afghan crews? I guess that must have been some cultural hours. Yeah, so I haven't personally taught any Afghani crews. The two times I've been out to Afghanistan, they've been ground-based um, jobs. Um, um, but I have, in my time, probably about 20, 25% of my um, instructional hours have been with foreign students. So um, mainly Middle East, so Saudi, uh, Qatari, uh, Kuwaiti. Um, I've also done some flying with some Kenyans and, and some Indians as well. So you do get a, a good mix there. Um, it's a really good experience for instructing, actually. One thing um, that always sticks in my mind um, is you really have to think about what you're saying um, to such a degree to make sure that there's no misunderstanding. And a good story that I always remember was uh, actually came from a, a Pakistani instructor that we had on the squadron. So he was an exchange officer. He was a Pakistani who was instructing on 72 Squadron on Sakane as one of the staff. And he said that when he first arrived in the UK, um, he was very confused why people kept asking him if he was happy with something or are you happy with that? And because he said sometimes he was being asked that for something that he clearly wouldn't be happy about. It wasn't something to get excited about or maybe it was bad news or whatever. And of course, if you think about it, that is something that I, I say and other people say, you know, are you happy with that? And it actually means do you understand that? But so even something as simple as that can lead to a misunderstanding. So um, in terms of experience for instructing, it's, um, it really helps like hone your skill effectively and make you think about what you're saying. Uh, okay, so hypothetical questions. If you're uh, responsible for replacing Scarno and could replace it with any aircraft, uh, I've already given it away, I'd go PC-21. So unfortunately, I'm nowhere near important enough to make those decisions, but I would have gone PC-21 and just had a two-tier system. So I would have had PC-21 and then the Hawk T2. Um, so you would do PC-21 for, um for elementary flying training and then if you were then streamed for multi-engine or helicopter you would then go off and do that and if you were carrying on the fast jet route then you would do a bit more on the pc21 and then and then go to the hawk but as i said i wasn't asked and i wasn't important enough to uh, offer my input so we have what we have now <laughs> uh given the rf now uses boom cable heavies yes um so well the e3 is obviously going but you're right um yeah pa is c17 yeah rc135 yeah so was it a mistake? No, I think the Voyager is a good replacement. Um, when you think about refueling, and actually, just from my from my experience, most of my refueling has been 
fast jets. Very little has been to large aircraft because really those large aircraft can stay airborne for a very long period of time or go very, very you know, great distances. So it does offer an option, but that option is not taken very much. Um, and obviously no one in the Air Force is trained to um, use boom. So we would have had to retrain everyone, which is not you know, impossible, but obviously adds a complication. So, um, and th there are options of, you know, retrofitting and things like that if we really, really needed to. But um, I think it's just been decided that most of the large aircraft, they don't, they don't need it. Or we're going to be working with our allies where they can refuel off the Americans, for example. <laughs> our desk job's good fun, or are they necessary for being an RF? I can only speak for myself, but um, yeah, I it's not for me. Um, it is a necessary evil if you, um, so I took promotion, I did it for domestic reasons. Um, and if you go to squadron leader, then um, you will be required to do what's called staff tour and a, and a command tour before you're then ready for further promotion if that's what you want to do. Um, so staff tour is exactly that, it's basically a desk job. So my job was at air command, um, I effectively went to lots of meetings as a representative of two group who um, at the time were responsible for all the multi-engine flying in the Air Force. So it was my previous experience. I would go to meetings and I would offer up my view on uh, and inputs on plans and things like that. Uh, at the moment, I also have another desk job because unfortunately timings and the fact that I wanted to move back to Lincolnshire. So I'm waiting to go back to an instructing job on 45 Squadron on the Fenham, um, but that won't happen until August. So I'm in a, a cap job, which is effectively procurement which again is not really what I imagined doing when I joined the Air Force, but it is one of those things and the Air Force pays me and they decide what they want me to do. So that is what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so I'm in procurement. So um, there, I should say there is an option where you can just stay flying. You can, um, you can, it's called professional air crew and effectively you can sign up to that as a flight lieutenant, as a junior officer. And um, that enables you to keep in uh, flying related jobs is what they say. It's not necessarily flying jobs, but it allows you to stay, um, to stay flying if that's what you wish to do uh, and of course that's good for the air force as well because they trained us to be pilots so for a lot of a lot of us they want us to keep doing that because they've invested in us so but good question Oops, skip to the bottom there we go so i'm just it's just skips i'm just trying to find out where i was there we go uh, as an instructor what were the identifying characters of a good student Oh, and what extent could you adapt to the to improve and identify weaknesses? Yeah, so I mean, every student's different. I mean, you would, I guess you would know that, but everyone's different. Every student's different. So, in a in a weird way, you don't really want pre um, uh, you know, conceptions of, about what uh, you know, what characteristics you might be looking for. So, um, it's more about recognizing the strengths and weaknesses of each individual, and then tailoring the training to that. Clearly, there's a syllabus, and that's set to what we have to teach. But how you go about that, there's a book, there's an instructor's guide on whichever aircraft you are instructing on, and that will tell you how to do something. However, you know, if that doesn't work or doesn't, you know, if the student doesn't get on with that, then of course part of being an instructor is to try and find another way of getting it across. Um, so, and, and that is different. And of course, each individual um, will uh, will prefer or dislike different types of instructing style as well. So, um, I know the Canadians, they they actually do some testing to try and pair up. Um, personality types. We don't do that in the Air Force, but um, but the, uh, the, there is probably some merit behind that. I would say just personally, um, because yeah, I think it, you get the best out of someone if you if you are connecting with them in the right way and, and sort of speaking to them in a way that they understand. I remember when I was a student, I, one of my first formation trips on the Takano, I was uh, as a lot of people do, I was over controlling and I was uh, sort of struggling, and what I was doing was moving the stick around a lot and I was pumping the throttle a lot. And my instructor just said to me. You know, over the intercom, you know, what is the what is the um, the lead aircraft doing? And I sort of thought that's a strange question, but it sort of broke me out of this. You know, maybe think about it. He said, "What is the lead aircraft doing?" And of course, it was just flying straight and level, or in a turn, or whatever. But effectively, he made me go through what I would be doing in the aircraft if I was leading and I was just flying the aircraft straight and level. And that made me realise that why was I moving the throttle so much? Why was I moving the stick so much? Because the person leading the formation was not doing that. And that sort of calmed me down and that got through to me and that made me learn not to over control when in formation, for example. So there's ways of getting through to people and that's really important. Yeah, so Ian Davies. Uh, yeah, I am. Yeah, so I'll be instructing on the, um, the Phenom. Oh, sorry, 100, 200. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, it might be the 200. I need to uh, get my uh, research done for that because uh, I've just been calling it the Phenom. Um, 
but yeah, ultimately it'd be quite exciting. It's a new aircraft type for me. I am going there as a flight commander, so I'll go as one of the execs on the squadron. So although I will be instructing, I won't be instructing as much as I was when I purely was an instructor. So, um, but yeah, I'll be back to flying. I'll be back to squadron life, which is what I really miss. And I actually really, really enjoy instructing. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And so August next year cannot come around quickly enough. Uh, yeah, uh, this one from Mike. Um, trip in a Texan. Yeah, I, I guess, I don't know, actually. I was going to say yes, I could, because I have colleagues there that I'm sure if I was to speak to them, I could get a trip. That being said, of course, it's now contract run, um, and um, they have quite a big say in how those aircraft are used. So probably, actually, possibly not, thinking about it. I think I would have friends there who would be willing to do that, but they may not find the flexibility to get me a flight what we used to have on the Takano was uh, sorties called um, SCT which was staff continuation training and that was basically um, time allocated where staff pilots and instructors could go and fly the aircraft to ensure that their handling and their their raw skills were good enough to be credible to the students because clearly a lot of the time when you're instructing you weren't actually flying um, and that's when you had the ability to sometimes take people on passenger rides or things or air experience and things like that uh, and they're important because they're a good way of getting people in the air force um, and from sister services who would not usually fly and get them airborne and give them an understanding of what the air force does so they are important but yeah at the moment because it's a contracted uh, solution the text and i'm not sure actually the flexibility is there for me to go and have a flight unfortunately <laughs> 90s are cool yeah they are uh, how how come you flew multis and your wife flew tornadoes is she better than you can be here for her? yeah i did one of my friends pick up this um <laughs> well you have to ask mike if you can uh, hear from her from uh, an interview at another time but yeah she's definitely better than me to be perfectly honest I, I made peace with that quite a while ago having started off down the fast jet route and then not made it and obviously my wife uh, was a couple of years later and joining the air force than me but she um she successfully got all the way through fast jet flying training and became a Tornado GR4 pilot. So, um, yeah, definitely very talented. And uh, I did go and get a couple of trips in the Hawk when she was at Bally um, um, on the course there. And I remember thinking that um, I probably would not have coped well with the increase in pace uh, and um, and what was being asked you. So the mental gymnastics and all that sort of stuff was never my forte. So, um yeah, yeah, she absolutely is. So, uh, luckily, she never uh, never took any fuel off me. So, uh, which is called prodding in the uh, in the sort of colloquialism for it. So, uh, my friends always wanted that to happen, but uh, we never actually tanked each other. And then we both went up to Linton as instructors. So, uh, that was good fun as well. Uh, the image of <laughs> yeah winning pieces of cheese over course is an interesting one yeah absolutely we never played with the little pieces because uh, you know the air force is always paranoid about loose articles so we just had to keep track of who had the cheeses and be honest about it if anyone came to the uh, q a late they won't know what the hell i'm on about um anthony what is the scariest flying moment you've had um scariest flying moment uh skim weirdly they're not i don't think they're scary at the time and I, don't, I think other people have said this because you just react to what's happening at the time and you fall back on your training so to make them a bit scarier i would say they were earlier in my career because you're not as prepared and you don't have as much experience to fall back on so uh, on the Takano on a night solo um quite early in the course with not that many hours under my belt i got airborne and uh, not long after takeoff i got attention getters so um red flashing lights on the cockpit um which I had forgot to put to night. Um, so they were very, very bright. So there was a switch you could go day to night and uh, I left them on day. So they were very bright. So they got my attention and I had a hydraulic caption. And uh, I remember thinking at the time there were two hydraulic captions you could get. Um, and if you did the wrong drill, you could make the situation worse. So I remember having to take a moment to really make sure I was getting the right one because I was very paranoid about getting taking the wrong action. Anyway, I did, I did the correct thing and I went back um, to um, the airfield. So I hadn't I hadn't gone very far. I went back in. Um, they clear the circuit as, an, as a standard. So if um, if someone comes back on an emergency and it's a genuine emergency, um, particularly as a student, they'll clear everyone else out of the way. Um, the reason for that is you might make mistakes and I did which I didn't realize until I'd landed but I actually turned the wrong way into circuit so I went right instead of left or whichever way around it was so again thankfully they got everyone out of the way and um, and then I touched down and, and, and landed and taxis off and shut down and it actually turned out and you, you, know, you sort of think to yourself on these things well what was it was it anything severe was it just a you know a mistake or an error um, on you know and some sort of sensor but actually my hydraulic pipe had burst I had lost all my main hydraulic pressure and I had to blow the gear down with the standby um, pressure, which was a one shot go. And I remember that you always talked about this. It was 
quite awkwardly positioned behind the ejection seat and you had to pull this handle and hold it for three seconds and you had to wait for the gear to blow down and hope that you got three greens so you know i was doing all that with not that many hours under my belt as a sort of you know 20 year old 21 year old so and that was quite interesting um um, but yeah, I mean, so but I'm not sure it was scary. I, I guess you just think about it after the time. But definitely, if you have less experience, I think these things are, stick with you more. Um, which fast jet would you have given your left arm or any other bodily part to fly? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, uh, fast jet, pure fast jet, as in terms of what we would recognise as like a fighter or, or you know probably like the F-14 because it's just it's just um, iconic for anyone that was brought up in the 80s and sort of you know, Top Gun, etc. Um, but anything that's a jet and fast, then I would probably go larger. So I, I, I love the B1. And, and obviously, I've, I've said in the interviews as well, the Blackbird would have been amazing because it's just unique. So, um, yeah, there's a few there. But um, the Americans seem to have the, uh, the selection of the, the best toys. Uh, so MGM says, with regards to the VC10, I guess a perfect refueling isn't as memorable as a botched one. Correct me if I'm wrong. Continuing that for what was your worst refueling? Yeah, I mean, um, so perfect refuelings are memorable. Um, but really what it means is that you leave um, with no spare gas. So you've done your job, you've, you've given everything you can, and there's a satisfaction to that, knowing that you've uh, given as much fuel as possible. Um, botched ones, yeah, I mean, um, you get you get problems sometimes. So uh, uh, a receiver might um, damage the, the the hose or the, uh, the the basket around the hose. Um, sometimes they miss and sort of skewer their probe through it, and that can cause problems. And um, that can get quite exciting. There was a couple of times that uh, harriers were quite susceptible to it, and you would be worried about it damage going into their intakes or breaking the canopy. Um, you might have to jettison hoses if they got stuck out, so and, and they literally just fall away from the aircraft. So we usually did that over the uh, over the sea if we could. Um, and sometimes just you know some some uh, receivers might struggle. I remember we did. You have the ability to send someone away effectively in training, not probably for a uh, operation, but in training you could probably send someone away if they're if they're not performing. And because clearly you know the the, the tanker aircraft doesn't have any ejection seats, it doesn't have any safety. You know if, if something was to go horribly wrong, then there's going to be serious consequences. So we did once send an Italian typhoon away because um, they were struggling. And I don't know how much refueling they'd done, but they were struggling and we didn't feel comfortable. So um, we we said they had to go back. So you you have that power if you need to in in the case of a uh, an, uh, a training sortie you wouldn't expect someone to be experienced on a you know, operational sort skip again two seconds uh fabian you are the chief engineer for one day what would you change at the uh, change at the Ticano? um Ticano. what would i change um yeah, I might put an auto trim in so that you don't have to uh, always play with the rudder whenever you change the power because the torque effect's quite strong. Um, no, I like the Tucano. It's nice and simple. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a fun aircraft. It's a good training aircraft. So I'm not sure I would change that much. Yeah. So uh, yeah, my multi-engine background. Would I go to the airlines? It's a good question. A lot of my colleagues have. I think you get to a point in your life where um, military lifestyle is not necessarily um, what you want anymore. Um, and that then, you know, the airlines offer a bit more of a um, planned out sort of stable lifestyle. Uh, and obviously the money is a little bit better in the airlines as well. But for me, uh, I like the variety that the Air Force gives on on the whole, in, in the majority. I mean, at times, obviously, um, it annoys me. And, you know, I'm not particularly fond of my desk job at the moment and getting short notice to go and do um, last minute deployments to Afghanistan and things like that can cause a bit of upheaval. But, you know, yeah, overall, that's the variety I like. And of course, you don't necessarily get that on the airlines. So equally, none of my Air Force qualifications read across to the airlines. So if I wanted to go and fly with BA or someone like that, I would need to have to go and do the qualifications myself. Um, I would get some dispensation for being military and having some flying hours, but there's a lot of money that I would have to throw at getting my qualifications. Um, and I'm, it's not a world that I'm that proficient in. I, yes, I've done air transport with the Air Force, but not not to the degree that an airline pilot would obviously. It's not as simple as just going there, but obviously a lot of my friends and colleagues have. And I suppose at the moment the industry is not really recruiting, although it seems to be getting a little bit better anyway. Uh, how much instructors were you given in the art of instruction when you became an instructor? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, you are, there's a there's a course. So you do uh, six months actually to be an instructor, whichever aircraft you go on to. So I did my course to be an instructor on the tutor. Um, and then, and it teaches you how to um, 
what to say and how to act and um, how to deal with students who are struggling and things like that. So it really does take you, because you won't know how to instruct, you might have an idea, but it, it gives you a, a basis, a foundation to work from. And everyone's an individual and you should play to your strengths, but it does give you a sort of foundation of how to instruct. Um, then when I moved to Takano, if I'd gone straight there, I would have done my course to learn how to instruct on Takano, but because I'd already qualified as an instructor, um, I uh, just did a quick conversion onto the aircraft. Um, so yeah, but you are you are taught. It's uh, and there's there's quite a lot of teaching on that as well. It's, it's really important to make sure you uh, understand how to get points across. Okay, um, so A. Bond says, um, what does it mean to be an officer in the RAF and currently going through the application process? Yeah, so officer in the Air Force. I mean, that's, this is the thing. Like, um, you know, um, pilots in the Air Force get accused quite often of just just joining to be a pilot. That wasn't the case for me. I you know I knew I was joining as an officer as well, and, and you know, there are elements of that that are really important to me. So, you know, as an officer in the Air Force, you, know, you are responsible for those that are placed under your command. I think it says that on the scroll that you get when you commission. And I take that very seriously. And I also find that really rewarding. So some of my most rewarding jobs, and most recently I, I did, uh, uh, I was commander of a detachment in Afghanistan from um, last summer to the Christmas. And, uh, you know, and uh, that was as rewarding as some of my flying jobs um, because effectively I was there to look after the people under my uh, under my command and make sure that you know they were um, safe and uh, got what they needed and do the best by them so and uh, you know and, and that's really really satisfying and uh, a really powerful thing to do so that yeah that that for me is what it means to be an officer in the air force is to you know use those wider reaching values that are taught to you on officer training um, which are important in everyday life um, you know, so respect and trust integrity all these things um, you know they just sound like buzzwords but you know if you're genuine then that they should be important to you and they and, and you will use them as an officer in the air force um, so that's what it means to me but uh, i would say good luck with your application process it's uh, it's uh, it's a you know, it's an interesting job um yeah, and uh, here, here to the good luck, absolutely. Uh, right, Mike Childs, I guess I've always loved the VC-10. What was it like to handle? Was it very heavy? Yeah, so weirdly, the VC-10 was quite heavy. Um, it had power-assisted controls, but again, being an older aircraft, it, it you could you, you it did feel like you were flying a big aircraft. Um, we didn't manually fly that much. Obviously, we used the autopilot, but the autopilot was quite old. Well, quite old. The autopilot was built when the aircraft was built, so um, it could it was quite limited in what it could do. So quite often, we would fly it. And that was enjoyable. You would fly the approaches and, um, you know, we'd fly it when we were tanking and in formation and things like that. But, yes, yeah, so I think if you were to do it for any long period of time, it might get a bit tedious uh, and quite quite tiring. Um, but, yeah, I loved it. It's a great aircraft. Beautiful for such a large aircraft. But then I haven't flown that many. But I did fly the A400 sim um, and qualified on that. And uh, you don't feel connected in the same way. The A400 is a very clever aircraft, as are most of the modern multi-engine aircraft. But... You, you are not connected in the same way that you are in an old aircraft. But I sound like a bit of a dinosaur there. <laughs> uh, whether in the VC-10 or Takano, what was your hairiest moment in the air? Uh, well, so I talked about the hydraulic leak, so that was interesting. Um, I have had a near miss on Takano as a student as well in terms of the head-to-head -head down the valley. It's just one of those things. Um, it was uh, in, uh, you know, I don't know if people know or not, but in the low flying system that the military uses, some valleys that you fly down, um, and of course you'll be in the valley. Um, so it's effectively quite a narrow piece of real estate for you to go down. A lot of them have what we call flow arrows, so they dictate which way you go down them, and this is to avoid what happened to me. But we were in a valley that wasn't, it didn't have a flow, flow system, a flow arrow, um, and that means that you can go either way down it. It's a wider valley, but you know, it still doesn't totally mitigate the risk. And uh, I was on an early low-level sortie, and my instructor was pointing out a good turning point to me on my right. So I, we, I guess we both had our eyes out to the right, and when we get back to the front, there was a, a Takano coming the other way pretty close so obviously um you avoid both by turning to the right and i don't know how close we were um but you know we talked about it when we got back and found out who it was and you know filed a report um you know and and there are there are systems in place now that should reduce the likelihood of that happening so that was a, that was a bit of an eye-opener um yeah I, you know so that vc10 no i haven't really things are calmer in a multi-engine things go wrong but they are calmer you have more redundancy in a multi-engine so yeah, they, you know, I've had engine problems and things like that, but they're never as they've never been as uh, as serious, or they've never felt as serious because there's redundancy and you've got a crew to work with. 
and things don't progress as quickly necessarily. Uh, how long is the Phenom course for uh, training multi engine pilot? I'm not sure, so I don't want to give you tough information. When I went through on 45, I did a short course, so I can't even be that helpful there. But um, I want to say it'll be around about six months. Actually, sorry, it might be up to about a year. So um, it's something you could probably just ask on um, you know, one of the Twitter forums for the RAF, or um, I guess 45 Squadron has probably got a Twitter account. And if you were to put a question up there, it's a very, very, very very valid question and I think they'd be able to give you a, a better answer than me but more often than not you know you won't see a course that's quicker than six months and sometimes when you know something like that where they are teaching you um you know all you've flown previously is the prefect then you know there's a lot to teach going on to the Phenom so um, I suspect it's probably about a year I'm sorry I couldn't be more accurate uh so when on the tutor was it a tri-service model used and where you're instructing students from now yeah. uh, yes so uh, yeah the tutor was across the board um um so the ones um 109b i want to say the grob 109 um yeah it was uh, it was the same i did teach royal navy the army did their own thing although they did also fly the tutor but they had their own uh, course that they did because of course the army only has helicopter pilots so they do a slightly different course to what the air force and the navy does but yeah like like i said earlier about 20 percent of my students have probably been um foreign but also uh, maybe a five ten percent have been uh, royal navy uh, because the fast jet pipeline particularly is all uh, synced together so yes i have uh, i have taught um uh, navy pilots as well uh, if you can fly a system on some material or similar can you purely hypothetically of course fly to car if you jump right in it and ask and stuff <laughs> um well i guess with anything doesn't it i always uh, i always whenever people ask about this i always link it back to sort of driving like we all know how to well, most of us know how to drive a car and the theory about how you drive a car but could you just jump in a bus could you jump in an f1 car um, the theory is the same, the steering wheel does the same thing, the gears do the same thing, the, the pedals do the same things, but there are nuances and subtleties that uh, that make it probably very challenging, if not impossible to do. So um, you would know how to fly it, Carno, and of course airborne, absolutely, you could because it's the same principle as flying a Cessna or anything else, but um, I'm not sure, you know, starting it, um, although I think there was only about five switches to start it, but probably depends how technically minded you are. Um, but yeah, there's always those little subtleties that might catch you out, I think. Skipped again. Sorry. Um Carno Air Force is there any correct operation? The other the not really, the Tacano is used uh, in South America and obviously um and a lot of those are super Tacanos as well. Uh, I don't know if anyone else uses it as a training aircraft. There may well be, but not that I was aware of. Um so no, we did have a really good collaboration with the Irish Air Corps. Um, so they fly um, PC-9s, but you know, it's a similar aircraft, it's a turboprop, they use it for their pilot training. Um, they're obviously a smaller organisation than the Royal Air Force, but um, yeah, instructing is instructing, and uh, they were based out of uh, Baldonnell in uh, near Dublin, and uh, we, we just had a really good relationship with them, and uh, we used to visit each other quite regularly, and uh, they used to fly over for some training benefits and things like that. So you do get these uh, collaborations with uh, foreign air forces. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same aircraft type. It can just be that you're doing the same the same type of job. Uh, I like the uh, Tacano as an air show aircraft. They thought it was underappreciated. <laughs> yeah, the Tacano always seemed to get the um, the lunchtime slot, didn't it, if the tutor wasn't there. I think the Tacano is a good aircraft for uh, air displays because it's got enough power to do most maneuvers it's uh, but it's not so sort of sporty that it uh, has to use up a lot of real estate so the Takane display and obviously we did display the Takane for quite a few years stays very much crowd center or within the, the you know within the bounds of the uh, the airfield so everyone can see it um, and it also does a lot of stalling maneuvers and things like that which I think are quite good because they, they add a different aspect to it um, but of course it's not very noisy and it depends what you like at air shows some people like the noise and obviously being a VC10 pilot as well then I, that, that used to make a lot of noise and that could set off car alarms it was that noisy so it depends what you like but uh, yes I was fond of the kind of I thought it was a nice balance um, and stayed so everyone could see it uh, so how often did you take on fuel in the VC10 uh, yeah we did but very rarely um, so we used to do it as um, on um, 
operational missions. So if um, if there were two VC-10s or a TriStar and a VC-10 and one was due to go off task and it had spare fuel, and because we had to fly to, particularly if we were doing Afghanistan where we were based out of uh, Qatar, so we had to fly for two hours to get there. So you would have burned significant fuel to get there. So if you could then take fuel from the off-going tanker, then that was efficient. So um, yes, we did, but it didn't happen that often. More often than not, tankers were empty on leaving. So it was quite rare that you ended up with uh, with spare gas. Usually it would be because a, a fast jet had cancelled or you know, had found someone else. So, um, but yeah, we did do it. Um, and yeah, we loved it because obviously it's big aircraft next to each other doing formation. So, um, but yeah, it was um, not that often. Uh, could it come over land on an aircraft carrier? Uh, it might be able to land on one. I, I don't think it would get airborne again. Um, I'm trying to think about how quickly you could stop it. So they're a good question. I I, I suspect because most uh, aircraft use hooks. I, I don't know. You could probably fly a Tucano slow enough and the carrier could move quick enough that I reckon you could put it on the carrier, um, but you'd never get it airborne again, I don't think. But, uh, but there you go, good question. Oh, well, that's very kind. So, uh, thank you, uh, Anthony. Um, could one loop the V10? I don't think so. Or barrel roll. I think I think because of the T tail. I, I've never been that great in my um, aerodynamics, but I I would say that with a T tail and the stability that offers, I would think it'd be very difficult to barrel roll a V10. Definitely to loop one. I guess a loop if you had enough power and the aircraft was light enough and enough you know altitude potentially. I mean, you can loop most aircraft. Um, barrel roll a bit trickier because of the stability, but. Uh, You'd spill all your uh, all your coffees anyway, so it wouldn't be a great idea. I don't think the passengers would be very happy. Uh, <laughs> what does a navigator do? One of them told me they fly the plane, but he didn't seem like he was clever enough. Um, well, the navigator does what he yeah. You know, well, they're not really called navigators anymore. They're called weapon systems operators or officers. Um, so they do all their on something like a tornado, although they're retired now. But um, yeah, the systems operator is probably a better term for a navigator. So they are using some of the additional systems on the aircraft. So um, sensors, um, you know, recce pods, targeting weapons, things like that is traditionally what a navigator would do. And also obviously making sure the aircraft goes where it's meant to go. So, but really they're just an additional person for the crew. And any any crew that has a navigator, you know, it's additional person to help problem solve and, and you know, and, uh, and, and that that's always beneficial, but of course, a lot of the pure navigating now is done by computers and and, and uh, moving maps and things like that. So, um, I mean, on the VC10, it was so old that they used to still use AstroNav, so it actually had a sextant mount, and you could put a sextant out the roof. And some of our really old navigators was, would tell us they were still capable of trained on uh, AstroNav. So, yeah, they did used to navigate, but technology moves on. Uh, yeah, so side by side in the Chichita or um, you know, tandem in the uh, Takane. So it's interesting. Side by side is great for uh, elementary flying training because you can see everything that the student is doing and they can see you. Um, and uh, you know that that has its purposes. Takane, you're sitting behind them, so you can't really see them. You can see their top of the head, and that's it. Um, so there's a reason that you know the, the student needs to be more um, proficient, I would say. Um, but you do get used to figuring out what they're up to. Um, but it definitely makes the student feel more in control and you know they get their wings after the Takano or after the Texan now and so very much you want them to feel like that they're the captain of the aircraft and um, the, the good thing about sitting behind them is that you can turn your mic off I used to do it all the time turn your mic off and sit there quietly and near the end of the course they would pretty much do everything themselves and they might not realize that they've actually you know, flown the whole sortie um, without you really inputting at all and that's what you want by the time you're going to give them and give you the, give them their wings so uh, they, they have they both have their purposes Okay, yeah, we're getting near the end now. So what we got, ever flown a Bulldog? Uh, yes, once uh, as a uh, air cadet when I was uh, 13, just before they retired it. So uh, that, I do, I still remember that. It was a, a crazy old guy that uh, it was an air, air experience flight. I remember he opened the canopy and got to put hands out to show me that, you know, the aircraft would go down with the uh, deflection of the air and stuff. So uh, yeah, I still remember it. Um, uh, air cadets, uh, when I leave school, my ambition to join the RF spy recruit. Stay in the air cadets, uh, Josh. Uh, so I was an air cadet, I stayed all the way up to joining. Um, it offers fantastic opportunities, whether or not you uh, join the Air Force or not. It, you know, just do everything possible, everything that is offered to you, uh, do it, and you will not be disappointed. Um, and absolutely, the Air Force looks very, 
very favourably on anyone that's been a, uh, an air cadet. And if you choose to go to university, then I would also recommend the university air squadrons as well. So, um, but because both of them, both organisations, even if you don't join the Air Force, um, they offer some uh, truly, truly fantastic experiences and great, uh, great for whatever you choose to do in the future. So, uh, but yes, uh, so well done for being an air cadet. Uh, with the VCN rear engines, how does it affect handling flight characteristics? Uh, it makes it a lot easier. So you get a smooth wing, so the wing's really efficient, So and hence it can go high speed. Um, you get very little asymmetric, so multi-engines, obviously, if you lose an engine on one side or the other, then the aircraft's going to naturally swing to the side that the, uh, the um, engine's still working, uh, and you're going to have to trim that out. But with the engine circular together at the back, you don't get much of an asymmetry, so it was easier to handle on that side. Uh, they're out of the way as well, so um, you're not going to ingest fog and things like that. So there are many benefits to having it up there. Of course, they can't be as large, um, and structurally, it's not as strong up there. So there are disadvantages as well, but um, it was that's why it was designed like that, but mainly for the clean wing. The differences from a pilot's perspective when flying aircraft with engines mounted in the back. Uh, sorry, so we just sort of covered that as well. So yes, it's a bit easier for most uh, most aspects, and it's very quiet. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, uh, oh, right, yeah, possibly, yeah, yeah, definitely outside my knowledge there about um, launching um, uh, off uh, carriers. Thanks, Alan. And thank you, Bill. Um, a question about what years were you flying for? I was on the VC 10 2007 to 2010. I think, well, it's like you guys uh, know as well. I've probably got time for one more if you want, or Mike can step in if he wants to. Um, yes, uh, Chris, I'm going to try and get them. Uh, thank you, all uh, all you guys coming in, but I'm going to get one in um, because I'm going to be a bit greedy here. <laughs> I've heard um, when, like, uh, I think it was the 135 guys when they used to tank uh, the F-14s, sometimes they used to swing the wings back and forth. Did you ever get that with the tornadoes on the tankers? Ooh, I swing wing. I, yeah, so so usually they would have their wings forward because swing when they're in the delta, it's for high speed flight. So, but I, there there were circumstances when they would position them differently. But you'd have to, you're going to have to interview my wife because uh, I, I, it's uh, outside of my remit for uh, talking about swing wing. Other than that, it looks quite cool. As I said in the interview, of course, the tornado GR four did struggle at height, so um, because it's designed to be a ground attack bomber and the engines were better at low level. So um, as they got heavier, they struggled to keep in contact with the VC ten. Um, so you might see them flying with a burner in to uh, to stay in contact, which obviously is burning fuel almost as quickly as it's taking fuel on, but you know, every every drop uh, counted when it was operations, so because that would give them more time over target for the uh, effort. Yeah. Uh, as soon as we have any type of jet pilot, yeah, I got called out for being a, a wannabe fast jet pilot um, on the other interview, but yes, yeah, so that's what I wanted to do, but I'm not disappointed in how what I ended up flying in the Air Force, and, and nor should anyone, the, 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 whatever you fly in the Air Force is, is great fun. So. And I think what we should do here, Chris, is there's one question I think would be a great to wrap up on is from uh, Templar7832. If you can read that one, that'd be perfect, Chris. Is there another aircraft similar to the VC-10 you'd like to have flown from other countries? Yeah. Um, well, the only, the only truly similar aircraft is obviously that Russian thing. But that's so similar that you know, um, I guess it would be the same. So I'm going to stretch similarities. And I remember having a very jokey conversation with uh, a pilot of this aircraft when I was out in theatre in Ali Deed. Um, so at the B1, because I claimed that it's uh, four engines at the back. It's pretty fast. Um, and, you know, they're similar size. Um, and, you know, could we could we set up an exchange? Um, he didn't think that was possible. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I still have my hopes that one day I'll get a call up for a, for a B1. Um um, and a friend of mine still doesn't know if the B1 is noisier than the, uh, the VC-10. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, what a great Q&A. So, Chris, thank you very much for coming on. And also, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, there were some great questions. And, Chris, hopefully you jo uh, enjoyed this tonight. It was great. It's my pleasure. It's like rapid fire. If I, wanted to, uh, if I was speaking to you quickly, I apologise, but I wanted to get through as many questions as possible. So, uh, yeah, great, great. Really good, uh, really good crowd. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. So, guys, as well, before I sign off, uh, Chris, can we find you online anywhere? You're on Twitter or anything like that? 
Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, so it's Nasha one 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 Nash. Um, not very catchy, but um, I don't think there's many of them. Um, I don't put too much on it, but um, you know, I, I do like things that are linked to aviation. I do put things on sometimes, um, and some little videos and bits and bobs. And I have set up a YouTube channel. Uh, I've been a bit a uh, bit poor at uploading videos, but I am trying to go through my back catalogue because I realise that I've got a lot of videos from when I haven't been operating uh, various aircraft. Um, so some of them are a bit dated in terms of their quality, but uh, they offer a different view. So uh, you know, if you if you're interested in that, then subscribe, and I'll uh, I'll try and get some more videos up as well. Yeah, definitely, because I just uh, subscribed to your channel, so I'll link it in our comment yeah. section <laughs> on our YouTube channel, so you can go and give Chris a subscribe and everything like that. But uh, Chris, thank you very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you to all who have joined us. It's been a great Q and A. So cheers. Thank you. Cheers.